You can really tell who uh, has college classroom experience, can't you? <laughs> Very fine, uh, extemporaneous speaker. Our next speaker is going to be Dick Johnson from Foot Locker. And Dick flew in from New York uh, specifically for this conference. And he's going to fly right back after or shortly thereafter after his talk. So we really appreciate him making this extra effort. And I guess we could say literally going the extra mile. So we're delighted to have him. On July 1st of this year, 2011, Dick became the executive VP and group president of retail stores for Foot Locker. In this role, he is responsible for the company's domestic and international stores, as well as business development. So needless to say, he doesn't uh, have much spare time. And prior to his current role, he was the president and CEO of Foot Locker, Lady Foot Locker, Kids Foot Locker, and Foot Action. And prior to that, he was president and CEO of Foot Locker Europe for three years, from 2007 to 2010. So he was living and working in Europe. Um, from 2003 then to 2007, Dick was the president and CEO of East Bay, and he also served as v VP of merchandising at East Bay. He initially joined East Bay in 1993, just in case you were curious. Um, I'm kind of excited about this part, too. Uh, Dick is giving us a gift certificate for a pair of athletic shoes at East Bay uh, with no dollar limit. So if you win, you have to put your business card in the basket at the registration table, and there isn't a dollar limit. So you can just trot on in there and get your $250 pair of shoes that you've always wanted. But first you have to win. So make sure you're, you, that you have dropped your, your uh, business card in. And I mentioned earlier, too, that uh, Dick earned his undergraduate degree from UW-Eau Claire. Uh, obviously, he's been very successful, and we have all these stunning UW-Eau Claire graduates. I initially worked with Dick and recruited him to be a speaker for an e-commerce seminar that I produced in 2000 when I was still working at the Chamber. He did a really excellent job at that time for us. Uh, the internet was fairly new, e-commerce was just beginning, and I always kept that thought, and I thought, this man really understands advanced e-commerce, and he really understands distribution systems. So if I ever have the opportunity, I'm bringing him back. So here he is today. We're delighted to have him with us. Let's welcome Dick Johnson. You know, it has been a little bit of a hectic schedule lately, so I'm glad that uh, they provided a name tag because sometimes I forget who I am. But I will tell you that I never forget where I'm from, and that's central Wisconsin and Wausau. It's been a great place for me to, to uh, hone my skills as a professional, and it's great to be back to uh, address you today. Uh, you know, Eric's opening comments, uh, and quoting Thomas Friedman about the world being flat, certainly true. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure it's flat, but I know that it's getting a lot smaller technology, the internet, et cetera, and I'll talk about some of those things in a bit, have certainly made our world much smaller. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk, and Michael just referenced uh, manufacturing, how important it is to the economy, and I'm here to talk to you about the other side of the equation, you know, service business. You know, pretty successful service of business that was hatched right here in, in Wausau, Wisconsin. And while I don't, uh, I don't disagree with Michael, I believe that manufacturing is important, as I've spent more time back here after returning from Europe, living in New York, uh, we actually have a place uh, north of here, so I was back a lot this summer. I drive through the, the, uh, the industrial park area. I see a lot of open spaces. You know, so if we're waiting for manufacturing to come back, it could be a long wait. You know, we have to be proactive. We have to figure out how to do that. But we also have to acknowledge that there are other businesses, service businesses, technology businesses. No, I don't believe the next Apple will be here either. You know, I, I'm in agreement with Michael on that. But, you know, if you think about the state of Wisconsin and direct-to-consumer businesses, there's been some pretty successful companies here. You know, Land's End, Figgies, Swiss Colony, American Girl, and East Bay, just to name a few. I'm not sure why direct-to-consumer started in Wisconsin. You know, I don't think that there's any real tax benefits. It's not a very friendly place to do business, quite honestly. 
but for whatever reason, there's been a lot of it here, and there's been a lot of success to it. So, you know, Michael's point of view certainly comes from a professional economic uh, economist point of view. Mine's going to come to you uh, as a sneaker salesman. So uh, it's going to be a little bit on the, the the other side of the equation. So, uh, let's see here. They usually don't trust me with this sort of thing. So, I, I want to talk a little bit about me, and I certainly appreciate Mary's. Um, kind introduction, but you know, one of the things is, is I want to talk today is about East Bay being part of a much bigger company. I think that you have to understand that, that East Bay was founded here back in 1980, and I'll get into some of those details later. I joined the company back in 93, but prior to that I had been in Wausau working for Wausau Insurance Companies back in the early 80s. I uh, moved down to uh, uh, Janesville, actually, and worked in one of the places where they did build cars in, in uh, Wisconsin up till the last few years when General Motors closed uh, the assembly plant down there. I uh, joined, I worked for Grable Van Lines here in Wausau when I came back in 1990. Joined East Bay in 1993. Um, very happily employed, could have been in, in Wausau for the rest of my career I believed and then uh, in 2007 got a call from my boss and I still believe he thought that I was in Warsaw, Poland so the move to Amsterdam would be very easy. You know, but. Uh, so I, I ended up uh, taking my youngest son and my wife and we moved to Holland for, uh, for three years and I ran, I, and again you have to remember that I was a dot com slash catalog guy and I didn't even like stores that much and suddenly I was responsible for 520 stores in 17 countries where they didn't all speak the same language, they didn't all use the same money and even though we think the Eurozone is this one big happy family, they still have very specific borders and, and uh, trends and customs apply around those borders. And then uh, came back to the U.S. and, and uh, ran the U.S. divisions for Foot Locker, uh, and Mary listed them off uh, well. So was in that position for a little bit over a year when my, uh, our chairman uh, and CEO wanted to reorganize the company and put all of the stores together under one person. That happened to be me. I have a, a, a lot of contact with the team here in Wausau because they still do support our dot-com business. So the team here in, in Wausau, Wisconsin is responsible for the global internet enterprise that is footlocker.com. So, you know, it, it's uh, a different point of view on the economy. It's certainly not, um, not from a manufacturer's point of view, but we distribute product out of Wausau around the globe. You know, that's not what our focus is, but we certainly have deliveries that go out all over. And our vision, you know, as Foot Locker is truly to become you know, the leading global retailer of athletically inspired shoes and apparel. It sounds, you know, pretty concise, pretty clear, but when you think about the size of the globe and, and you know, Western Europe we certainly have covered, uh, we've got some franchising arrangements in the Mideast and in, in Korea. I was just over in Korea and visited our franchise there. You know, the, the concept of the world being flat and being smaller, you know, Kohler bathroom fixtures and bathrooms all over China and Korea. You know, that was a surprise to me. I know Kohler's a massive company. I know they ship products everywhere. I just didn't expect to see, for whatever reason, me being naive, I guess, I was surprised to see Kohler bathroom fixtures in, sh in, in my hotel in Shanghai, for example. You know, so we, we are impacting the globe. You know, our, our economy in Wisconsin definitely impacts the globe. Yeah, so Foot Locker um, really does have that vision to be a global athletic retailer. You know, we're headquartered in New York City. Um, I, I've got the responsibility for just over 3,400 stores, and we cover North America uh, very well. That's where the, the, the majority of our stores are. But we've got stores in Australia and New Zealand. We've got uh, brand names like Foot Locker, Lady Foot Locker, Kids Foot Locker, Foot Action, Champs, and CCS is our latest acquisition. The, the thing that I want to reiterate is our global dot-com business is centered right here in Wausau, Wisconsin. So we've created a center of expertise here. It's not Silicon Valley. You know, it's not the Harvard group that sits up in the Northeast. We've created the technical expertise and the skills necessary to run a global internet business in Wausau, Wisconsin. You know, we have marketing sites that we've got set up in all of our regions, but Wausau is the center of expertise. Doesn't mean we don't use and facilitate people from Silicon Valley. They do some programming for us. You know, we use programmers in India. You know, we use uh, uh, distribution companies around the, the globe as well. But the center of expertise is right here in Marathon County. 
And I think that that, that really speaks well for what we've accomplished here. Uh, let's see, so again, just a, a map, you know, the flat world is, as uh, we referred to earlier. This is really where our strength lies. And, and you know, the 3,400 stores that we've got are all company stores that we own. Uh, the two flags here, one in uh, Korea and one in the Middle East, are two franchise relationships that we have. And the, the, the truth is it's hard to talk about being a global retailer or being a global anything when you don't cover South America. At this point, we really don't cover China. We don't cover the old Soviet Union, Russia. You know, so those are things that are under contemplation for us every day. You know, how do we become a retailer in those areas? If we become a bricks and mortar retailer in those areas, how do we go ahead and create a dot com business in those areas that can be functional given the things that go on? Uh, you know, the, the location is, is key, you know, locality is key. And how can we compete with a local dot com business that's trying to sell many of the same products? So those are some of the challenges that we face in our business. And, you know, as we look at it, you know, Foot Locker really is a global brand, but I, I, I want to just keep reiterating the point that the dot com business 100% is supported here in Wausau. Um, you know, we take orders and ship orders to all 50 states. Uh, the center of expertise is here. While we maintain marketing sites, we have people that travel from Wausau out to, to uh, our office in Vienna and to uh, our office in Australia, office in Canada to support those sites, uh, to provide them the expertise that they really need. A lot of people say, you know, why are you still located in central Wisconsin? You know, and it, it's a very good question. I mean, we, uh, the, the, the first part is easy. East Bay was founded here back in 1980. It was the logical place to be. We had significant, significant growth. Uh, Art Rick and uh, Harry Cocord, who joined them later on, had significant growth from 1980 right up to 1997. 1997, the company was acquired by what was then known as the Woolworth Company, which was an $11 billion retailer that didn't react well when Walmart started changing the distribution model. Woolworth kind of stayed uh, hunkered down in their old, we're going to win on, on Main Street, and Walmart really came in, changed the model. Uh, Woolworth is now, uh, although having just been in Australia, well, where Woolworth still exists, the name is still out there, but in this country, Woolworth has disappeared. And it really is because they weren't willing or capable at the time or didn't have the vision at the time to see what Walmart was doing to the distribution changes, to, to creating uh, mega stores in a distribution channel that got product into the, into the consumer's hands faster. So we were acquired by the, the then Woolworth company in 1997. Um, Woolworth went through some metamorphoses. It became the Venator company as, as things were, uh, the company was essentially disbanded and, and got focused just on sporting goods and sports and, and brick and mortar retail. Um, so we were now part of uh, Foot Locker Inc. as the company changed names over time. And it, it's, uh, we're, we're approaching $6 billion. So we went from an $11 billion at acquisition. The company has shrunk by peeling things off and disbanding a little bit. We, we uh, bottomed out at about four and a half billion and now in the last few years we've rebounded to almost a six billion dollar company. 1997 when we were acquired we built some new facilities here in, or we moved into some new facilities here in Wausau. Um, for those of you that, that uh, were around back in the 90s, um, the, the, the Third Street Park downtown, you know, I, I'm sure it has a name by now, I'm not sure, but uh, you know, the, the park down there used to be a, a street of, of retail fronts, and most of those retail fronts uh, in 1996 were occupied by East Bay. There was a retail store, then we had phone centers and an outlet center, and that was really the, the entire block was, was, uh, was ours. Um, we moved across the river to the old Prangueway Center. We remodeled it. It's been a great home since 1997. It's bursting at the seams a little bit, but uh, you know, hopefully they'll be able to figure out how to continue to grow there. At the same time, we moved into a new distribution center out on 72nd Avenue. Uh, it was 250,000 square feet at the time. Uh, it's since expanded to half a million square feet and a half a million square feet of, of distribution center in the center of a state that's a long way from the main transportation hubs is a little bit of a risky business. And, and one of the challenges of doing business here is that we are located so far north uh, from Memphis, from Louisville, you know, where you've got FedEx and UPS located. 
um, you know, that, that really make the, the ability to get the product into the customer's hands much easier. So over time, you know, we had to evaluate each of those steps and now that we've been acquired and, and we're part of a much bigger public company, we have to ask the questions many times, where should we be and why are we still in Wausau, Wisconsin? Every time we do the analysis, it comes out, comes back that Wausau is the right place for this company to be. Now we've, we've gone ahead and we've looked at call centers, for example, you know, Michael referenced call centers in India where they speak uh, pretty good English. Um, we, we've evaluated that. Can we actually move a call center to, uh, to uh, India? You know, take advantage of the 24-hour the, the clock in the sun. You know, we've looked at it, we've evaluated it, we came back to Wausau. You know, could we put a distribution center down closer to Louisville or Memphis? We evaluated sites, you know, southern Illinois, Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, etc. Could we move there? Absolutely, we could move there tomorrow but it's not the right thing to do for the business. So you know, it, it's a tough evaluation that you have to go through, but there's a lot of things that, that really make central Wisconsin special. And when you start to go through the economics, the economics could tilt the other way, but there are a lot of uh, intangibles that come back to you that you see and you say, this really is the right place to be. There's an incredible work ethic here. You know, and I think that's something that you should all be proud of, uh, whether you, you've been here a few months, a few years, or all of your life. The work ethic that exists in Marathon County and Central Wisconsin, you know, having, having had the great opportunity to travel a bit, I believe is second to none. The willingness to get the job done, to figure out what job has to be done, and then go ahead and do it is, is really pretty special. There's a strong education system. You know, our state network of universities. Yeah, there's a lot of intellectual property and intellectual development down in Madison, but the satellite campuses around, uh, the, around the state put out some, uh, I'll humbly say, some pretty darn good graduates over the years. So, you know, uh, being, a, being a blue gold from Eau Claire, I feel very strongly about, uh, I'm not sure what a blue gold is, by the way, and, and eventually I'd like to figure that out, but, you know, I feel strongly about the education system here in Wisconsin and the, the ability to put out talented executives, people that can grow in their, their, uh, their capabilities, and people who we can, we can take from Wausau, move to New York, move to Viannan, uh, over in Holland, you know, potentially move into to, uh, other parts of the, the world to help support our business. You know, we made the conscious decision to create, I've, I've referred to it a couple of times, a center of excellence sort of strategy that allows this location to hold the experts as it relates to not necessarily uh, internet site development and coding, but the expertise for um, commerce, electronic commerce to happen here in Wausau. And Mary, uh, Mary reflected back to uh, the e-commerce uh, presentation back in 2002, I think. It seems like a long, long time ago. But I guess Al Gore had just finished creating the internet back then and we were able to talk about, uh, talk about doing some commerce. And at that time our business was probably, uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to go back and get the exact numbers, but our business was probably 90% catalog, 10% internet. You know, Mary probably has the old deck that I put together and she'll tell me that those numbers aren't quite exactly what I, I quoted back then. But just rough figures, 90-10. Now it hasn't gone completely inverse from that, but our catalogs now are used more as a marketing vehicle and the call centers that we've got uh, here and in, uh, in Oshkosh are used to field customer service calls. You know, again, those calls could be serviced out of India, they could be serviced out of Ireland, there's a lot of great places where there's, there, there's effective call centers, but the, the right thing to do, if, if we have to have a phone agent run out to the distribution center and look at the actual color on a garment, they have the ability to do that. Not so easy if you're calling from Bangalore and you want to figure out what color the orange is on that team uniform. So again, little things, but when it comes to servicing a customer, we believe that the bottle that we've got here today is, is right. I talked about the globe, and, and I really have been blessed to, to see a lot of the, the, the uh, a lot of areas. And I, I spent the last two and a half weeks in Australia, uh, Hong Kong, mainland China, and Korea. And what it really taught me is that our world is, in fact, getting much smaller. You know, when you think about the the number of people, those cities that I just met, or the the countries that I just mentioned, I was in. 
you know, a, a dozen cities, and it, it probably is the city where 120 million people live. You know, which again, first time I had traveled mainland China, but to be in uh, to be in Beijing, to be in Hangzhou, to be in in Shanghai, and see the development and and honestly the westernization. Again, what was the big surprise for me? You know, it, it went beyond the cold or bathroom fixtures, but English is everywhere. You know, I didn't once feel challenged for language. You know, the signs on how to get onto the, the bullet train, the, the signs to get to the airport, English is everywhere. You know, I, I, and I say that humbly as an American, but it has become the language of the globe, outside of Paris, of course, but uh, that, that's a, a separate item as well. So. Um, you, you know, I, I think one of the things that's happened over time is that, that the Internet truly has changed expectations of consumers, it's changed expectations of retailers, it's changed uh, expectations of manufacturers. You know, the, the truth in my business is that trends can, can start anytime, anywhere. You know, my son always tells me that I'm, I'm getting old and I, I guess that's a, a true statement, but you, you know, the reference is Back in the day, you know, trends would start on the east, in this country, trends would start on the east coast and the west coast. They'd slowly make their way to the Midwest, and, and you could have the product life cycle for a sneaker or a garment could be three, four, five years, because it just took that long for things to move. Now, when Fabe Fibre is on the stage in Milan, the kid and my son in Wausau can see exactly what he's wearing at exactly the instant that he's wearing it and decide that that may be what he wants to wear. We have to, as a, as a global company, we have to be prepared for those trends to move and change and make those changes as quickly as we can. You know, one of the challenges to that is, is we are the reseller of brands. We're a house of brands, Nike, Reebok, Adidas, Puma, you name it, we sell it. The challenge is that those brands still control their distribution model. Okay, so one of our, our, our challenges today is with our, our business in Australia. We have a pretty good internet business serviced out of Wassa that ships products into Australia. The Australian Nike team doesn't range many of the products that we sell to them. So they have an issue with us shipping products into their market. And it's not just Nike, it's, it's uh, truly all of the brands that we sell. So if a, if a baseball spike that's used here in the U.S. shows up in the Australian market, we get phone calls from them saying, what are you doing shipping that product into to Australia? You know, our our uh, commercial agreements with them limit the areas that we can do business in argument is that we do do business in Australia, so you know, the, 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 the opportunity to ship there shouldn't be superseded by a boundary that we artificially put around North America. You know, so that's one of the challenges when you think about the businesses. Vertical guys, you know, Zara, H&M, Forever 21, they hold a huge advantage in that they can be whoever they want, wherever they want to be, whenever they want to be. You know, if you resell brands, you have some constraints around you in terms of being able to really service that brand or service, you know, you, the retailer, servicing that brand around the globe. So we look at that model all of the time. We work with our key manufacturers, obviously. Um, they'd want, they all want us to build a center of excellence and a distribution center and all of those things around the globe, and we continue to argue that there may be some benefit to that, but if we're going to build a distribution center in Australia, and our, our e-commerce be centered out of Australia, but we're limited to ranging what we can sell in Australia today, we really don't have an interest in that. We want to provide a much broader assortment of products, and that's one of the things that the Internet's done, right? You know, if I'm constrained in a mall in, in the U.S. to a 3,000 square foot box, I have a very limited assortment that I can show to people. You know, it's not that, that the Internet provides me an unlimited space, but what I can really do is take my 500,000 square feet that I've got out on 72nd Avenue and I can turn that into a massive store. That's actually what people want to look at. One of the reasons we don't have an eSpace store, a much bigger eSpace store here in Wausau, is that people really want to see the distribution center. They want to see everything that we've got. So I remember back even when we opened up the store uh, uh, where it is today, I remember being in the store having a, a 
carload of kids that were headed up to camp somewhere up north, they had to see the East Bay store and they all came in with their catalogs rolled up in their pockets. They walked into the store and they said, this is it? You know, wh wh where's all this stuff? You know, and they're flipping open the catalogs. So that's one of the challenges with, uh, with that brand. But no matter where we are, we really have to be positioned to service our customer. And, and part, of, uh, part of that challenge is that the customer can exist anywhere. So I think, you know, when you, when you go back, and I talked about the trends, but, you know, it used to be that you had to get stories and press releases created for a news cycle, right? Well, now the news cycle can happen with, with Twitter, can happen at any given minute. You know, I'm very actively interested in the NBA lockout settlement discussions and trying to get them, you know, progressed along. Well, there's a, a tweet every 10 minutes that refers to that. They don't have to worry about getting it done for the 6 o'clock news because as soon as it's done, Dwayne Wade will come out and fire off a, a tweet that says, hey, we settled, it's done, boom. You know, and that, that's the difference in our world today. You know, and it continues to change and evolve. And, and you know, the people that, that my sons at 18 and 24, your children, that next generation, they live with this device. I mean, this is their world. And, and we have to be ready to adapt to that. We have to find leaders that understand that. We have to develop systems and processes and, and, and um, formats that allow them to work and function effectively, knowing full well that everything that they need is in a device in their pocket that's generally in their hand. So actually, Duane will have a great opportunity because with all of the thumb surgeries that are going to have to happen eventually, you know, there's, a, there's a, a good, good opportunity in the healthcare field. So I think we have to proactively manage the content and the, the timing of uh, the communication with our customer. You know, they're in charge but we can manage that. You know, they want to be interacted with when they want to be interacted with, where they want to be interacted with, and how they want to be interacted with. But to a certain degree, we can still manage that. You create a robust system that allows you to speak to them when they want to be spoken to, and you, you just have to change the way you think. We used to serve up an awful lot of static pages, you know, on our internet sites. And that was great because if you wanted to come in and learn about the uh, the Adidas Climacool shoe, or you wanted to come in and see what happens, what's going on with you biomechanically when you overpronate or you supinate. You know, those static pages were great, but now we have to create much more dynamic content that says, okay, this consumer is coming in through that IP address, that means they're likely located here or there, this is the topic that they clicked on from the search engine that brings us there. So we have to, on the fly, assimilate a page that speaks to you and what you want to hear. You know, it's a, it's a much different, even in the 10 years since we did the first internet commerce uh, thing here in Wausau, it's a much different dynamic. So again, being prepared, you know, the customer is in control. I mean, for the longest, longest time, you know, and again, I'm speaking specifically from a retail point of view. Uh, for the longest time, the, 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 the retailer, you know, the, the manufacturer of the product, they were really in charge. You put out a Sunday flyer, um, you drive people into the store for a sale, they get a little discount, life feels pretty good. You know, now the customer's walking through the mall and says, oh, I need a pair of sneakers. You know, isn't it great when we can actually ping them at the point that they walk by our store and say, hey, we've got the, the Adidas Climacool in 27 colors available in Foot Locker. You know, they're within 300 feet of our store, boom, they're in. Now, a lot of it to, to, uh, to to, to some of us that are older in the room, feels a little bit big brotherish. You know, I'm not sure that I want my telephone to know where I am, and more importantly, I'm not sure that I want a retailer to be able to speak to me as I walk by their door. But for the 20-something today, it's become pretty normal. So again, it's a mindset shift. It's thinking about the consumer. It's thinking about how they want to interact. Um, you know, for us, we have to try to figure out how to make that interaction fairly seamless. It, it's, we have a big investment in bricks and mortar. You know, 34, over 3,400 stores around the, the, the globe. Uh, we don't own those stores, obviously. We lease them through, through malls. But the investment in the hardware in the stores, the investment in the distribution system to get product there, we're, we're well vested in bricks and mortar, and, and we continue to do that. But the, the customer doesn't think 
brick and mortar doesn't think internet doesn't think mobile, they think Foot Locker or they think East Bay or they think Lady Foot Locker. And whatever we do has to be the same. You know, they have to get the same experience, feel the same experience. So I think there are, are a, great, a lot of great opportunities to continue to, to, to update our systems, to control how we speak with that customer while they're in control. And again, it's been a change for me. You know, I guess the best part of, of being in my job is we employ an awful lot of young people. You know, so you see how their points of view and how they deal with things have changed. You know, and it keeps me, me you know, constantly thinking. You know, I always had my, my focus group of two with two boys at home. You know, I could get their opinion on product. Um, you know, as they got into technology, I could get their, their points of view on technology. But now I'm really surrounded by a, a bunch of young, aggressive, bright, I, I refer to them as the kids, but that, that's really what they are. But they are our future. And I think, you know, one of the challenges when you think about working and creating an enterprise in central Wisconsin is how do you bring that future here? You know, we found one of our challenges as we tried to recruit talent here in Wausau is th there's a, a life cycle of everybody's career, right? You graduate from college, um, you know, central Wisconsin probably isn't that appealing to you. You know, you, big cities are appealing, you know, late nights, all of the things that New York City, Chicago, Minneapolis can provide. Those are all very appealing, so you go off and you know, we have a lot of, we have four, five, six guys living together in an apartment in New York because that's the only way they can be there, but they love it. You know, they, they thrive on the energy of the city. Um, they work hard all day, they play hard all night, and then they get up the next day and do it again. You know, that's not going to go on forever, right? I mean, there comes that point when it's time to think about, okay, maybe central Wisconsin isn't such a bad place. You know, I want to raise my kids. I want to get a great, my kids get a great education, whatever. The unfortunate piece is, by that point, they've probably priced themselves out of our market. So it's a question of what can, sort of environment can we create here to get them into our marketplace, to bring the bright, the talented here, you know, and, and help them grow up here. And once they get here, you know, once I got here, I was here. You know, I, I guess that's not a true statement because I'm not here anymore, but, you know, it, uh, I, I really assumed that I would be here forever and we, we wanted to raise our kids here and we're, we're, we're very pleased with how that all worked. But it, it really is a point in time. So we have to think about that. You know, there are customers today, they'll be our employees tomorrow. How do we bring them into a, a location like central Wisconsin, give them the activity, give them the nurturing, and help them develop professionally the way that you can in, in New York? A, a seminar like this is a great opportunity. I mean, in, New, in, in New York City, on any given day, at any of the hotels in Midtown, there is a seminar about technology. There is a seminar about global economics. There is a seminar about you name it, and it's there. You know, so we have the ability to send people on, on virtually a daily or weekly basis if we chose to. They're exposed to that many more things. That will never happen here. Even with this great facility, you won't have that sort of, we will not have that sort of ability to do it on a regular, you know, recurring daily sort of basis. So we have to think about what does the internet provide us? Can we get them hooked up with, uh, with like-minded people, you know, around the globe? So, you know, the, one of the questions that Jeff had earlier is how do we think globally and act globally? I, I, I don't think that's possible. You know, I think that you really have to go back to the adage of, of thinking globally, because we have to, but you have to be able to act locally. You know, even with Wausau being the center of, our, of expertise for us from a, a dot-com and internet perspective, we have local marketing sites that are maintained in all of our regions. They know the nuances. You know, they make sure that our copy is written in proper English if it's going into the UK. They translate things into French if it's going into Quebec. You know, so I, I think you have to engineer your process so that you can, can in fact have a global vision, a global strategy. You can attack the globe from a lot of different places, but you have to have the ability and you have to have the talent in your system to be able to act locally. You know, I don't think that that's really changed. And as the world gets smaller, you know, maybe the acting local and the instant access, maybe acting locally actually becomes a little bit easier. You know, I, it's interesting, you know, we have a more difficult time with French-speaking people in Quebec, Canada, than we do with French-speaking people in France. The laws around the French language are more stringent in Quebec 
than they are in France. I, I, I find that difficult to understand, but it's one of the things that we have to battle in, uh, in our business. So as the, the globe shrinks, and again, this isn't the U.S. goes and conquers all, but if English becomes the common language, will we ever have to translate a website again? You know, as, as commerce laws change, you know, today we have to have terms and conditions translated into every language that we do business in, but the content can in fact be in English in most places outside of Quebec. Um, you know, so there, it, it presents great opportunities for us to adapt to the local market. I think that, that we, as leaders, have to maintain a strong sense of control. You know, it's difficult when you've got the, the local actions that have to take place to sit in New York or sit in Wausau or sit in wherever it happens to be and, and maintain control, but you have to have strong processes in place that allow you to, to maintain that control. At the same time, you have to be willing to utilize and leverage local resource to make sure that everything that you do has local relevance. You know, my first trip to, to China the, the last couple weeks, I don't have a great understanding of the China, China cultural issues. So I brought in a, a Chinese expert to help me just to make sure that I know how to exchange business cards. You know, the fact that I couldn't wear sneakers when we met the chairman of, of the board of one of, our, uh, one of our, the companies that we're talking to over there. Sneakers, they find offensive, which I'm not sure why we would choose to do business with them if they find sneakers offensive. But maybe it's sneakers with a suit they don't like, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, so making sure that you understand what the, is locally relevant and making sure that you understand that the customer can, can be anywhere and come from anywhere. You know, our East Bay customers that, that have known and, and grown to love East Bay, you know, they could well take a, a semester in uh, the south of France going to school. They could be in Italy, they could be in Russia, but they still have a desire for the products that we sell. So you have to understand that they're going to create business around them. One of the reasons that we ship so much product into Australia today and New Zealand Back in the, the early 80s, there was a tremendous fast-pitch softball culture, especially down around Madison. There was a team called The Farm. And The Farm would bring in, because of the seasonal differences, The Farm would bring in all sorts of Australian and New Zealand softball players. And Art and Rick, over time, had a chance to meet them, sold them a lot of product. They went back and said, oh, we can get this great softball product from East Bay because it wasn't readily available. Softball was not one of the major sports down there. They just had great softball players. So the genesis of the amount of product that we ship, uh, we ship into the Southern Hemisphere really stems from guys that were here, saw the product, saw the availability, and went back and said, hey, we got to get it. You know, now things have changed a little bit. Back then, you know, the, the U.S. dollar was worth this and the Aussie dollar was worth this, and now they're about equal. So now they're trying to buy because it's a tremendous competitive advantage, you know, from a, from a spending point of view. A pair of sneakers, uh, for example, that cost $100 here in the U.S. costs 160 Aussie dollars, and the dollars are about on par. So we know that somebody's making money in the equation, that much I'm sure of. Um, you know, one of the things that we've stressed to, to as we've expanded our, our reach around the globe is that you live by your default. So if English is our default, we try to live that, by that, and, and suffer consequences as, if we have to. You know, sometimes local content's not necessary, and you have to be in a position to understand that. And most importantly, we've understood for a long time that the next big thing can come from anywhere. You know, I, I think Michael's right in that you know, if you take the concentration of, of, of computer engineers and, and systems engineers and you look at the density of them out in Silicon Valley, the likelihood of the next big thing coming from out, you know, for the internet in any way, coming from out there is pretty high. But the truth is that it can come from anywhere. I talked to some folks uh, while I was in China. One of them was a young college graduate. He said that the dorm rooms at the university that he graduated from aren't really dorm rooms. They're startup entrepreneurial internet shops. You know, so the, the, the rooms are filled with computers. They're filled with young, bright people that are going away. You know, to a certain degree, it's a little bit about the Facebook startup. You know, everybody's trying to write that code that will lead them to something bigger and better. We said the kids go to school. They do their classwork. They get done with their classes. They pile into a, a room, and they just start going. You know, I thought, you know, so the next big thing truly can come from anywhere. 
So as I think about what it is that we're trying to do and, and how important Central Wisconsin is, you, you know, hopefully my passion for Central Wisconsin has, has come through because I am a believer and I think that, that what we can accomplish here from an from a, a economic point of view is important. You know, tourism, agriculture, all the things. But if you go back, I mean, Central Wisconsin has been successful in business for a long time from uh, from the, the, the logging and lumber and paper manufacturing industries to the insurance companies that exist in central Wisconsin to uh, the ginseng that Michael mentioned. There's a lot of great things that have gone on here from a business point of view. You know, as our world gets smaller, we need to take advantage of that. The one thing about a smaller world and you know, a bunch of bright Chinese college students sitting around is that competition has become more fierce no matter what industry you're in competition is much more fierce and it really can come from anywhere. I think we have a lot of great resources here. You know, I think the education system, I think the work ethic, the things that I've talked about, the infrastructure that, that, that is built is solid, can get, always get better, but we have to focus on what we've got here and try to explode that into something. And it might not be the next Apple. You know what, the, the next Apple, uh, the next Facebook, you know, those are our, our lightning strikes. Okay. I'm not sure that's going to happen here, but we can build good, solid, strong businesses that can serve a consumer around the globe, and I think that that can happen, you know, whether it is manufacturing that finds its way back in a bigger way into central Wisconsin, or it's service industries, or it's technology jobs. You know, all of those things can happen in central Wisconsin. You know, maybe it's the guys that are down in Madison with all of the, the, the intellectual property that they churn out you know, day in and day out. Maybe the lake country of the northern part of Wisconsin isn't quite so bad. You know, maybe that's how we, we make some strides. And then, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer that you always have to look forward. You learn from the past, but you look forward. And, and you know, I referenced some of the open spots in the, the, uh, the industrial park. You know, we had a, a bigger manufacturing base here. Absolutely, we did. A lot of good things. Still have a solid manufacturing base. But we shouldn't reflect on that and hope that it comes back. We should look forward and say, what can we do to create energy in this market, to create an opportunity for businesses in this market, to make it easier to do business? I'll share a little story, and this goes back to our expansion. You know, we, uh, we opened up here, and we had about 300 seats in our call center back in, uh, back in the mid-2000s. We ran out of labor at that point. You know, there was just not enough bodies to answer phones. And you know what, answering the phone isn't a glamorous, sexy job. It, it's not going to pay $100,000 a year, but it's a good, solid, honest day's work of a job. We ran out of bodies. We could not find enough bodies. So we, uh, we opened up a, a call center over in Oshkosh. You know, and we had talked to the mayor's office. We had talked to the, the folks and said, you know, we have to do this just because there's not enough bodies. At one point, we were even busing people in from Athens and Edgar to bring them in to, to work here just because there was pools of, of bodies available. Um, but we couldn't, it wasn't a sustainable, sustainable model. Oshkosh worked out very well. We, we moved into a facility there close to the university, got good uh, response from the university, got good response from the city of Oshkosh, you know, continue to have a very successful call center there. A couple years later, um, we really felt the need, because of the 24-hour nature of our business, we really felt the need again, and we looked at taking things to Ireland, we looked at taking the call center into India at that point, didn't make sense for us, um, but, and we actually wanted to stay domiciled in Wisconsin for some nexus reasons that, uh, you know, as, as uh, state government struggle for funding are, are quickly going away as internet sales are being going to be taxed everywhere which is which is okay but until that happens we try to protect our nexus so we we actually came back then we needed space here and we talked to some local politicians and they really said there's nothing we can do for you so we had a conversation with the city of green bay green bay opened their arms we went over to green bay and built the call center so we, if we want to win in central Wisconsin, we have to make it easier to do business here. We have to ha want business here. And, and I'll, I'll quote, I won't tell you who the quote's from, but the quote at the time was, well, those are just call center jobs. Just call center. I'll, I'll remember that till I die. They're just call center jobs. And we employ 1,000 call center employees around the state of Wisconsin. I don't personally think that's a bad thing. They don't get paid the way manufacturing jobs do, but they're employed 
give them a great opportunity to do an honest day's work. So, again, I, I don't think we can reflect on what we've had, but I think we have to focus on what we can create. And I think we can create a, a real opportunity to win here. So I want to thank Mary and the Chamber and, and uh, all of you for attending. You know, like I said, it's kind of the rambling thoughts of a shoe salesman, but um, you know, I think we've done okay for ourselves and we're going to continue to uh, try to make you happy. And Mary did uh, mention um, you know, one of the things, it's a present to win. So I think the real shtick here is Mary doesn't want people to leave at the intermission here when you go out for a little break. So you have to come back in order to get your card drawn to, uh, to, uh, and also to hear the next two speakers. Uh, um, I think Dwayne and Glenn have got some great things to add to the, the, the discussion. So thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dick. Thank you very much, Mike.